Today I'm going to cover the epidemiology of osteoporosis and fractures in women living with HIV. We'll talk about some putative mechanisms, inflammation and antiretroviral therapy being the most important ones. And then in the last little bit we'll talk about some management strategies. So, um, osteoporosis and fractures are among the things that are uh, non-AIDS conditions that we're starting to recognize more as our population ages. Um, it's osteoporosis and fractures are, I think, among the, those um, less thought to be uh, an issue of mortality, but more, one of morbidity, but of growing importance. So what is osteoporosis? Osteoporosis is a systemic skeletal disease of aging. It's characterized by low bone density and microarchitectural deterioration and reduced bone strength. And that leads to clinical presentation of fragility fractures. Fragility fractures are when you fracture from uh, a non-traumatic event, so falling from about standing height or less. And it usually occurs at the vertebrae, the hip, and the wrist. So diagnosis is by DEXA, which is a dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, and um, they usually talk about T-scores. So T-scores um, of greater than two and a half standard deviations below that of a young normal person of your same uh, sex means that you have osteoporosis. This has great predictive uh, ability in older populations because the risk of fracture increases two to three fold for each standard deviation decrease in bone mineral density. Now, what I'm showing you in the pictures on the, on the left are uh, from high resolution um, CTs. Uh, and those are done for research purposes, uh, but maybe eventually moving into more of a clinical realm. Uh, the other thing to note is that fractures are really uh, important in terms of morbidity. Uh, it's estimated that one in three women over the age of 50 in their lifetime will fracture, one in five men uh, over the age of 50. So when we first started working in this field, uh, we really focused on the postmenopausal women um, because we thought that if anything uh, about HIV was going to make it worse, it should really manifest most in that postmenopausal group. So in this group of studies from uh, um, New York City, we recruited recruited uh, postmenopausal HIV positive women and HIV negative controls who are matched for age and race. And here we find on the left panel that the uh, uh, women living with HIV had lower bone density, about seven to eight percent lower. And then over a one year follow up, they had greater loss of their bone density at the hip and at the radius than uninfected controls. Um, we looked into sort of mechanism by probing into um, bone formation and bone resorption rates. You can measure those by looking in the sera and, and measuring osteocalcin as a bone formation marker and N-telepeptide as a resorption marker. There are many other types of markers at this time uh, of the study. These are the ones that were most um, commonly used. And we found that uh, both bone formation and resorption markers were higher in the women living with HIV, suggesting that there's greater bone remodeling overall, and that the TNF alpha was higher as well. And in a multivariate uh, model, when we put in TNF into the model, it attenuated the effect of HIV on bone, which suggests that maybe uh, part of this was mediated by inflammation. Um, we also did this uh, high-resolution CT study on um, on groups, uh, and we found that the cortical thickness, which is the rind on the side of the bone that you see, was thinner in the women who were HIV positive versus those who were negative that were similar in age. Um, this is a sort of follow-on data looking at this uh, phenomena that we're just uh, in the process of analyzing uh, from a cohort called the WISE. It's the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which is a study in the United States at, in, in many um, New York cities that both have a population that's uh, infected and an uninfected control group. Um, the cohort is about 3,000, and this was a study of about 250 women in which we chose to enroll them at the time of their menopausal transition. So in um, sort of late uh, premenopause, early perimenopause uh, in one group, and then those who are in late perimenopause and postmenopausal in another group, and we had them uh, separated by HIV positive and negative. And so here, looking at lumbar spine T score, I'm sorry, T scores at the distal radius, the total hip, and the lumbar spine, you can see that there is an additive effect of HIV and the menopausal status. That is, the women who are postmenopausal and HIV positive had the lowest. Uh, 
uh, bone densities in all three um, uh, sites, and those who were HIV negative and premenopausal had uh, the best uh, and uh, in between of the two middle groups. So what does all this mean in terms of the bone density? Does it really actually translate to fractures, uh, which is what's actually clinically impor important? And this is a study done by Virginia Triant in um, using the, uh, uh, the, Boston, uh, sorry, the uh, Massachusetts uh, database where she showed that ICD-9 coded fragility fractures in uh, people living with HIV were greater. Uh, in both men and women as compared to similar, uh, as controlled to the general population from this database. And you can see that the prevalence of fractures really starts to separate for the women at around 50 or so, at the time that you would expect menopausal transition to happen. Uh, in the men, it seems to stratify a little bit earlier. Um, this is a study in which we took the WISE cohort and looked at incident fractures over time. And here you can see that um, the HIV-infected women had a greater incidence of fracture. Uh, the unadjusted incidence was 2.19 versus 1.54 per 100 person years in the uninfected group. And you can see that with longer follow-up, they seem to have more fractures as well. Okay, so what is the cause of HIV-associated bone loss and fracture? Uh, there's a whole list of things that we can consider because uh, we know that host factors are important for bone uh, mass and strength, as well as uh, fracture. Uh, there are ART factors and there are VIR-specific factors. Among the host ones, uh, there are things like hypogonadism, uh, sort of estrogen deficiency or testosterone deficiency. Um, there are uh, co-infections are actually quite important. Hepatitis C co-infection, we've learned to, that it is very important among HIV patients as well. Uh, and then other things that are, are known and very well known in the general population, such as weight loss and decreased activity and vitamin D deficiency. As far as um, the virus itself, there are culture-based studies, in vitro studies, that suggest that viral proteins or um, mostly viral proteins have direct uh, effects on bone cells in culture. Uh, and then there is a lot of literature looking at the immune effects and whether or not immune activation, chronic immune activation with HIV might have an effect on the virus. And these have done, been, been um, looked at in both animal models and in in vitro models and, and some clinical data. And then there's a whole bunch of data on the effect of ART itself. So there are studies in culture models in which you can look at direct effects of antiretrovirals on bone cells. There is specific studies looking at whether or not there's inadequate mineralization, specifically with tenofovir, and then also the role of immune reconstitution. I think the greatest um, what single pictorial representation of the, of the independent effects of HIV and ART initiation come from the START sub-study. So this is a study in which patients were randomized to immediate versus deferred antiretroviral initiation. And so you can see in the gray line, that's the change in bone density uh, before in the deferred group. And you can see that there is uh, some net loss of about 1% or so during that period of time um, before antiretroviral therapy, but much greater loss in the red line after initiation of antiretroviral therapy. So in this uh, group of individuals um, in the START substudy, they're sort of at the age where you wouldn't expect much in the way of change in, in bone density. Uh, so that um, slight change of 1% is significant. Um, this is a sort of figure to, to illustrate what might be going on thinking about the immune activation effects. So we know that HIV is associated with chronic immune activation uh, that's measurable by uh, markers of T-cell activation, monocyte activation, um, and that there are higher levels of soluble markers of, of uh, inflammation such as TNF, IL-6, and, and rank ligand. Those are very important um, cytokines for driving osteoclasts to differentiate and begin to resorb or bone. Uh, they also inhibit osteoblasts from uh, doing their work of uh, forming bone. Um, there are uh, some data that show that they can cause increase in apoptosis, decrease in replication capacity, and decrease in function. So when you have HIV infection mediated by the inflammation, um, uh, there's a net effect of having more bone resorption than bone formation that leads to net bone loss. Uh, 
what happens with estrogen? Um, well, estrogen has direct effects on bone cells. It can uh, affect both osteoblasts and osteoclasts, and the net effect is basically to, to, to inhibit resorption and maintain bone, bone formation. Uh, it also modulates the effect of cytokines on bone cells. So you can conceptualize that you know, when uh, people are premenopausal, that they have this protective effect of estrogen, and that when they lose it, it may be even more profound in those who have a background of chronic inflammation, such as HIV, because you lose the effect of estrogen on modulating the inflammatory markers on the bone cells. So we, in the same study that I showed you before about the WISE study, we looked at these particular uh, activation markers, cellular activation markers, and their association with bone. And here you can see that both the, the known markers of immune activation for T cells, as well as specific expression of rank ligand, which is a very uh, important promoter of osteoclastogenesis, were higher in the HIV-positive women than the HIV-negative women. But when we looked at them in relationship to bone density, so uh, T scores less than negative one versus T scores greater than negative one, low versus high normal bone density, we didn't find this association. So I don't think this disproves the fact that there is uh, potentially an immune component to this, um, to the effect of HIV on bone. It may mean that the activation markers that we chose are not the right ones. It may mean that bone density itself is not a discriminating enough uh, outcome to look at. And so some of those other studies in which we're going to look at its relationship to higher resolution CT and other markers of, of bone, uh, and also on the soluble markers of immune inflammation are ongoing. And I hope to be able to share with you that data at a future date. Okay, so now moving on to the independent effects of antiretroviral therapy. As we saw from the START study, there is that net loss of about uh, 2 to 4%, and it, this has been borne out in many, many studies of different antiretroviral regimens for initiation. And the dynamic is such that the bone loss occurs within the first year. It sort of reaches its, its nadir, the most bone loss, uh, after about a year, and then it starts to come back up, so it starts to stabilize. But it never goes back up to the pre-ART level. And this is a, a, this, uh, f um, a figure from uh, an ACTG study that looks at two different uh, NRTI combinations, tenofovir FTC and abacavir 3TC, uh, paired with either a Fabrins or adazanavir boosted uh, by ritonavir. And you can see that there are differential effects uh, of different combinations of antiretrovirals. Um, looking mechanistically, remember I showed you the data before about bone turnover markers, so this is what it looks like with initiation and well, of, of ART. And first, what you see is an increase in a bone resorption marker. This happens at the one month to three month window, and it really peaks by six months. You see the red line, which is the bone formation marker, it takes a little bit while to start to compensate and start to go up. Um, this is all while uh, inf inflammatory markers are going down, as expected with antiretroviral therapy. So this does suggest that ART has an effect on bone. It may be that this window period in which there's excess resorption followed by compensation of bone formation that takes a while to start to compensate is, is the reason why we see that uh, acute bone loss within that first six to 12 month period. And then once things stabilize, once the bone formation reaches the same level of the bone resorption, once they pair up, then there's stabilization of bone. Um, when we look at differences by different regimens within studies, you can see that tenofovir is one that consistently shows up of having, and this is not tenofovir, but tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, so TDF, is the one that consistently shows a greater effect on bone than uh, other uh, NRTIs or in comparison to integrase inhibitors in the regimen. And so, um, the last study over there shows the, the effect of the new formulation of tenofovir, tenofovir alafenamide fumarate, and you can see that there's less effect when that is used in the regimen than when TDF is used. Um, a, most, uh, a recent study that's been published looking at integrase-based regimens, uh, either bictegavir FTC paired with tenofovir alafenamide fumarate or dolutegavir lamivudine paired with abacavir, incredibly showed that there was almost negligible effect on bone density. So that's the one that's highlighted, and I've compared them to the studies that I showed you in the previous slide. And so you can see there's almost no, 
no measurable effect on lumbar spine bone density after a year. So it begs the question, if now that we know which uh, antiretrovirals are, are more toxic to bone, uh, when we switch everybody to these regimens, will osteoporosis and fractures be a, a problem still for HIV patients? And I think for many adults, um, this probably will be less of a problem. And we're probably going to see that in the United States that the fracture incidence will decrease, um, that the difference between HIV positive and negatives will decrease over time. What I do worry about is the younger folks. So we have about 15 million people living with HIV who are under the age of 25. And we know that HIV infection and antiretrovirals at an early age may have an additional impact. And here's a, a hypothetical uh, figure that, that demonstrates that if you get infected with HIV and start ART um, early in life, you may never reach that genetically determined peak bone mass, which should occur by your 20s, so sometime between 20 and 30. And if you don't reach that point, uh, then you're going to be at higher risk for bone loss and fracture and have earlier and more fractures in adulthood. So um, to, to, to test this hypothesis, we collaborated with uh, investigators in Johannesburg um, through this cohort uh, of 219 uh, children who were infected perinatally. Um, they were a, a part of a, a treatment group um, for a study called Neverest. So they were started on antiretrovirals early, before the age of three at that time. And they started on, they were on a lopinavir, ritonavir based ART. And then they were randomized in a second stage of that study to either stay on lopinavir, ritonavir or switch to a Favrins. So we uh, entered the study at a time when they were about um, uh, five to eight years old, and we recruited 281 uninfected controls from siblings, so mostly household and sibling controls, so similar environmental background, but uninfected. And we measured their bone density by DEXA. And in children, we talk about not bone density, but bone mineral content. And here you can see that the infected group and the uninfected group have differences in terms of their bone mineral content, both by whole body and by lumbar spine, with the uh, perinatally infected children having lower. And that's even after adjustment for uh, age and height uh, and differences Etc. And this appeared both in the boys and the girls stratified. Um, in this CROI, we are uh, Stephanie Shao is showing data from this study that looks at uh, peripheral quantitative CT. So this is using a CT technology, and you can see some of the pictures there that can separate out the cortical bone and the trabecular bone. The cortical bone being the outside, the trabecular spongy bone on the inside. And then also it shows this composite measure called uh, polar SSI, or strain index. And that measures the strength of the bone uh, for twisting and bending. And here we can see that in the girls and in the boys that the HIV positive group had lower strength in terms of their bone uh, using this index. So here we see that HIV has an effect in, in the younger group. Um, here. This is a study that we did in New York City looking at what happens in uh, boys who were infected perinatally uh, at the, uh, now at the age of 20 to 30 when they should have peak bone mass, so their highest bone mass. And so we recruited three, three groups, uh, one group of perinatally infected um, uh, children who are now young adults, um, another of those who were infected during adolescence, and another of uninfected individuals uh, with the same uh, age and, and, and um, race ethnicity at that 20 to 30 year peak bone mass age. And here we find that grouped together, the HIV positive had lower bone density by DEXA, and also by this high-resolution CT measure, they had lower indices in total volumetric bone mineral density, trabecular bo uh, bone mineral density, trabecular thickness, cortical thickness. Those are all uh, sort of architectural uh, parameters, structural parameters. And when you tie them together into a stiffness index, which is similar to the SSI that I showed you before, uh, which is a good estimate of total bone strength, they were lower. Okay, and this was also true that the perinatally infected um, had lower stiffness 
or bone strength than those who were infected during adolescence. So this is not separating out the independent effects of HIV and ART, it's both, because all of these patients were on antiretroviral therapy. But I do think that um, in, in individuals who are infected at an early age, before 20 and 30, where they have not yet attained their peak bone mass, there is a net uh, um, insult to their bone, and that they may not see the fractures occur until later in life, but it may uh, have a lasting effect on, on their fracture risk. Okay, so management of, of osteoporosis and fracture. So what can we do to prevent bone loss with ART initiation? I think the, it is remarkable that over all these years we're starting to come out with evidence that there are certainly regimens that have minimal toxicity on bone density. And you know, when we can, we should use those. Um, in people who are at risk of, of fractures, as people who have low bone weight, who have hypogonadism, for instance, who are older, I think avoidance of p boosted PI regimens and TDF uh, should, should be possible. Um, if you can't and you have a limitation in, in the regimen that you have uh, to, to use, uh, what can you do? We have a study, um, an ACTG study, which demonstrated that with one particular regimen, tenofovir, a TDF, FTC, and efavirenz, that supplementation with 4,000 international units of vitamin D3 and 1,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate daily mitigated the bone loss. It cut it by about a half. Um, we're not sure whether or not this extends to other antiretroviral regimens um, and whether or not different doses of, of vitamin D may have similar impacts. Uh, but that is solid evidence that with that particular um, regimen, if you pair it with vitamin D and calcium supplementation, you can, you can mitigate a lot of the, the, the bad effects on bone. There is a study by uh, Igor Furkin um, that looked at whether uh, initiation of bisphosphonates with antiretroviral therapy will prevent bone loss, and indeed it did. Um, you can see from that, that red line of zoledronic acid that it actually increased bone density by about uh, 1% as opposed to loss. Um, but I think this is probably impractical for most situations and, and may not be so necessary now that we know uh, which regimens to avoid and which ones have very favorable bone profiles. As far as screening for older individuals, um, this is a, uh, a figure that shows the progression of thinking over time. So in the beginning, um, we, the, the, advocation, the, the idea was to advocate for screening for uh, HIV individuals with fracture risks. But now, having really understood the amount of risk that HIV and antiretrovirals confer, um, the recommendation is to screen, when possible, uh, all men and women over the age of 50 with DEXAs to determine whether or not um, uh, any sort of modification is necessary for their antiretrovirals or additional treatment. Practically speaking, this does not occur, uh, even in the United States, even in my own clinic. Um, but the recommendation is there, and I think it's, it's sound evidence that when you, when you can do it, that you, you, you could. Um, what do you do once you find the DEXA results? The first thing is if you do have um, a low bone density or osteoporosis, you should look at some of the secondary factors that are uh, modifiable that you that, that may be present, such as low vitamin D deficiency, sorry, vitamin D deficiency, hyperparathyroidism, hypogonadism. And phosphate wasting, this is certainly an issue for uh, patients who are on TDF, um, and, and that should be checked if you have a patient who's on TDF. Um, we know that if you do have a patient who's on TDF and has low bone density, that switching to either a, a TAF or an integrase inhibitor, uh, or if you have someone who's on protease inhibitor and switching to an integrase inhibitor, that you're going to have short-term gains in bone density, somewhere in the range of uh, one to two and a half percent. Um, so that's an easy thing to do now that we have access to so many different regimens in, in the United States. Um, and can be done. And so um, as, as a first measure to do that and then checking a DEXA to decide what to do next, I think is a reasonable approach when you can. Um, what about vitamin D supplementation in patients who are on antiretrovirals? I showed you some data about what to do with initiation with TDF, three, uh, FTC, and efavirenz. What about in, in patients who are already on their antiretrovirals? Does it help? Uh, Peter Havens has a study that looked at adolescents on TDF-based uh, antiretrovirals, and he gave them 50,000 international units of uh, vitamin D3 monthly. 
um, uh, and and he found an increase in in, in bone density. Um, these are in adolescents, and it was, a, it was a small increase. We did the same study on postmenopausal women um, at Columbia, and we chose slightly different regimens. So we thought that it would be unethical to give no vitamin D supplementation um, because uh, everybody um, should be on some sort of uh, D supplementation in calcium when they're postmenopausal. So we had a low group of 1,000 versus a moderate dose group of 3,000, and we found no difference in bone density between those two groups. So um, whether or not there is no net effect or if the, the effect, the positive effects on bone for postmenopausal women are already there at a low dose of 1,000 international units daily a day, uh, we don't really know. But certainly there's good rationale for giving supplementation to postmenopausal women in the general population for their bone health and should extend to, to, to HIV-infected individuals as well. What about when you change their antiretrovirals and you still have low bone density or osteoporosis, what can you do? Bisphosphonates are the, the first line treatment and there have been six randomized clinical trials in HIV infected individuals in combination with calcium and vitamin D given to patients who are on antiretroviral therapy and they've had no interactions with the antiretroviral therapy and have the same degree of effect on bone as in the general population. So I think they're safe and, and can be used both an oral once a week version or zoledronic acid as a once a year infusion. There are other um, there are reasons why you wouldn't want to give bisphosphonates to everybody who didn't need it uh, is because there are risks, although they're rare. There's uh, the subtrochanteric fracture or atypical femoral shaft fractures. Very rare with less than five years of use um, and osteonecrosis of the jaw. So uh, when somebody needs to have, be on a bisphosphonate, they should, and it's safe in that regard. But uh, I think that you do need to think about um, whether or not they truly need to be on it. Uh, if that's not enough uh, and your bone density doesn't improve, there is teriparatide, uh, which has been, uh, case reports of it has been uh, reported in HIV uh, to be safely used and effective. The other two, denosumab and romazosumab, have not been looked at in HIV. Uh, there is one thing that you know, we've, I've been thinking about, and, um, and that is th there's a shift in, in our acceptance of utilization of hormone replacement therapy now. Uh, recently, the North American Menopause Society has uh, released a statement that for women aged younger than 60 and who are within 10 years of menopause onset who have no contraindications, the risk-benefit ratio is favorable for treatment of bothersome vasomotor symptoms and for those with elevated risk of bone loss or fracture with hormone replacement therapy. So th this is not a first-line treatment in the National Osteoporosis Foundation guidelines because of the fear of cardiovascular and, and clot disease. But Reanalysis of the data and, and newer data that's emerged in the last 10 years since the Women's Health Initiative have revealed that in, in the group that's less than 60 and with uh, less than 10 years of menopause, the risk is really negligible. So I think we ought to give more thought into whether or not this should be uh, something that we do for women who are transitioning in the early years of menopause. And certainly for bone, there's great data that it's helpful. Okay, so in summary, uh, for screening, I think DEXAs, uh, if you can, um, screen in, in men and women over the age of 50. Um, there is a recommendation from the European AIDS Society to use FRAX, uh, an online tool of fracture risk calculation when the DEXA is not available. For ART initiation, you can avoid TDF and, and protease inhibitor containing regimens and use uh, integrase or abacavir or, or TAF when you, you can. Um, and with folks who are on established ART switching uh, will gain 1% to 2% of bone density and maybe delay treatment with other uh, therapies like bisphosphonates. Gaps in knowledge. Um, I think one of the more important ones for me is are there better ways to determine who's at higher risk of bone loss in ART for, with ART initiation or for fracture? Uh, I've looked at some stuff with the FRAX. Um, we have uh, investigated into biomarkers and advanced imaging, and then a probe of, of bone strength called osteoprobe, which is um, a study that's semi-invasive, but um, used for research purposes. So th there are some ideas about some things that can improve our way of defining. 
as I mentioned, I think hormone replacement therapy is something that we should give a little more thought to. Uh, and then determining what the relative benefits of nutritional lifestyle modifications, especially in younger individuals, uh, I think is important. And, and understanding how to do this and to do the research in a resource-limited setting is also very important. I have some data on using portable ultrasounds in resource-limited settings that I'm happy to share with you, but I didn't have time to this time. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michael. That was a great overview. And lots of hands up. So I'll start here with Marshall at the front. Thank you very Thank you very much. It was really useful, really great talk. So I have two questions, if I may. I'm, I'm going to try to be brief. So the first one, sorry if it sounds a little bit stupid, but it comes from the point of view of an environment where uh, cost uh, is a restriction of drugs. So in the UK, in London especially, we can't just give tough to everybody. Again, I'm going to be brief and make yeah. this long story short. So in the... Um, in the, uh, the children, adolescents data that you showed, which is really useful because it's a question that we are asked very, very often. Um, if they are on TAF up to the age of 25 and uh, you have generic Truvada, can you switch them to TDF with Raltegravir, not with the boosted PI, as, as ideal as possible, uh, no other risk factors, uh, and, and when they turn 26? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think theoretically it's possible, but I think a Bacavir for bone is, is very good. If you're, if you're looking for an NRTI that's available in resource-limited settings, a Bacavir is good. The, a Bacavir plus a Favrins uh, is, is actually a, a very bone-safe regimen in the resource-limited setting in, in South Africa, as we've seen. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And then the other one is, so very, very interesting, because you said that, um, sorry, I, I, it's not provocative that I repeat what you said, but you said that if, so if I have um, a, a patient above the age of 50, I do a DEXA, there is osteoporosis, the patient is on TDF, I switch the patient to TAF, I can actually wait to treat by, with bisphosphonate. Uh, shall I repeat a DEXA three years later as per guidelines? I think one or two. One or two years later. One or two years later, I repeat it. If it's improved, I leave it. But if it's improved, but it's still osteoporotic. So, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that that's... that's <laughs> well, the a, clinical questions we're asking weekly. A, yeah, so I think that's a point in which you can decide to add a bisphosphonate. Okay, but you know, then again, if it's close and you want to wait another year, I don't think there's a problem with that either. Of course, but but I think that's that's the, that's exactly the way that I would see. But it is ethical to play around the antiretroviral therapy monitor and, yes. and so on. You yes. Know. Okay. Not everybody so, um, at the back, number one. Okay. Hi, Raina Patel from University of Washington. Um, Michael, that was such a great overview and such um, clinically relevant pearls. Thank you. Thank you. My um, question to you and, and to our audience here as well is, I really want to make this topic more relevant for the resource limited settings. And as our cohorts of treated patients are maturing in, in uh, resource limited settings, I think you know fractures are going to become an increasing reality. And I'm really keen that we learn from the resource rich setting and transfer these findings as quickly as possible to the limited settings. And so to that point, Michael, what, um, what caution and advice um, do you have for transferring some of these findings that are almost entirely, except for your um, you know, pediatric cohort, are almost entirely done in research with settings? How, what are the environmental or genetic factors that may be different in transferring these findings and lessons to the resource limited settings? I think those are all incredibly important questions. And I, I think the, the only thing that I think that I can say for certain is that um, there are diagnostic methods that we can transfer. <laughs> um, but as far as your question about uh, are the risks different for people of a different genetic background um, and who may have a different sort of physical activity level, um, those are all, and, and nutritional, uh, those are all really important questions. And I'm happy to share with you our individual data from South Africa because I think we are very, very interested in trying to tease those out. But I think they do have to be looked at in, in, in different uh, areas um, and, and, and basic decisions made about what can and cannot be transferred. So, time for one last question, number three. Yes. 
Uh, outstanding talk. Thanks. Uh, quick question about PrEP. So as you know, of course, TDF is used in PrEP. Yes. But of course, the people taking PrEP are HIV negative. So would you care to comment about the use of TDF in PrEP in relation to bone loss? Yeah, it's, I, I avoided the whole area because it, it, it takes, <laughs> no, it's actually, it's great, there's great data and it's actually fascinating, but I just didn't have time. TDF uh, in PrEP will decrease bone density by about 1%. And we know that both in men and women and in, in the US and in, in Africa, when you stop the TDF, that the bone density recovers. Unlike with HIV treatment, it recovers fully. All right. So I think there's, um, in if you're thinking about prep, is not as a lifelong thing, but in in times, uh, uh, it, just in periods of your life, or just during several years of higher risk periods and so forth, it may not have a long term deficit. Um, uh, I'll have to put in one plug for a study that Renee Heffron from the University of Washington is doing, which I think is fascinating, which is looking at the impact of TDF and um, uh, Depo-Provera in uh, younger women in Africa. And I think it's those kinds of questions that are still unanswered. Are there sp specific subpopulations in which um, PrEP uh, is actually not so neutral? Uh, and then so also in, in the really younger kids whether or not the total effect is not so neutral. But in you know, sort of people who've reached past the 20s and 30s, uh, on and off prep, I think there'll be negligible impact. Thank you. Thank you.